and welcome. My name is Paige and I am here with Deschutes Public Library. We are joined uh, by Jonathan Stewart. He is our author for this presentation. A Two Years Behind the Plow is the book that he has written about his adventures in Nepal and bringing the, the Green Revolution to Nepal. Jonathan Stewart has obtained degrees in history and journalism from the University of Oregon and has worked as a reporter for the Tuscalo Journal in Central Illinois. He is an avid long distance hiker, having trekked the length of the Pacific Crest Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, and the Hayduke Trail, and written a book about each. He has also hiked the Pacific Northwest Trail, the Great Divide Trail, the Long Trail, the Arizona, the Colorado, and the Great Enchantment Trail. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Stewart. Thank you, Paige. So this evening I'm gonna talk about, it's a, a memoir that I wrote on the two years that I spent in the Peace Corps in Nepal. And to share this with you, what I'm going to do is read a series of quotes from the book. So you can have some, have some understanding of um, what is in the book that I published here locally through Maverick Press here in Van. Um, if you wish to purchase a copy of this book, you can get a, a copy at Dudley's Bookstore. There's a few available there. This book is um, a memoir of, of looking back 50 years in the past and perhaps explains why I'm so keen about hiking today because uh, during the time that I was in Nepal, the only way I could get around at that time uh, was by foot. And basically the village that I lived in was about a four day walk from Kathmandu or about uh, 65 or 70 miles by trail over two passes that were well over seven, 8,000 feet. Anyway, with that, I'll, I'll uh, start, I'm going to share photographs I took at the time while I was in Nepal. And remember, this is world's quite different today, like much of Asia. Um, Nepal has changed as fast as China has, as fast as South Korea has, perhaps even as fast as Japan has. It's a much, much different world than it was um, when I was there 50 years ago. But with that, I'm going to share um, what it looked like then and how I, working with the Nepalese government, the Kingdom of Nepal, in the Kingdom of Nepal, uh, help bring the Green Revolution to that part of the world. So I'm going to start by reading a few quotes from the book. Um, this is a tale of a personal memoir of the Green Revolution, the forgotten war against famine uh, that I helped fight between 1969 and 1971. It's a remote war on the Indian subcontinent that is rarely documented from a foot soldier's perspective. The victories we won for world health and nutrition are easily forgotten, buried in the long-term challenges we created by introducing both the blessing and the curse of chemical fertilizers and pesticides to the subcontinent. Our only proof of victory is a booming population and a growing economy in a part of the world now threatened by global warming and the same pandemic that we're sharing. Perhaps the greatest winners of this agricultural turnaround are the oil-rich Gulf states that use the brains and muscle of Nepal's booming hill population to help construct their desert edifices and serve the wealthy elite that helps heat the world by another couple of degrees. Socrates believed that ideals belong in a world only the wise man can understand. This book that you may have a chance to read speaks to the ideals of my youth fighting a personal two-front war one protesting an unnecessary and unwanted war in Vietnam, and the second showcasing a new model of national service by fighting what proved to be a far more successful revolution against world hunger. I joined thousands of other idealistic young Peace Corps volunteers to help fight the Green Revolution. Like my great grandfather, a Union soldier who helped erase the horrors of slavery from the world, I helped reduce debilitating hunger on the Asian continent. In 1968, one in four people in the world went to the bed hungry. Today, half a century later, thanks to improved seeds, fertilizers, and farming practices, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, only one in nine does. So this is what we were facing. This was um, not uncommon in Nepal to see children like this suffering from famine, the bloated tummy, was caused by a lack of uh, proper nutrition. This was um, common through 
Nepal, and in the state of Bihar, just south of us in India, that uh, two years previously, before I had arrived there, a, a million and a half people had died of famine. And it was only thanks to food aid in the United States that helped in that, uh, uh, that curse. So we were Peace Corps, young Peace Corps volunteers. All of us were a college educated. Um, I'll read a few more quotes from the book. I joined the Peace Corps uh, eight years after it was established by President John F. Kennedy with an executive order in March, 1961. The appeal to a new vision of national service worked. By 1966, Peace Corps enrollment peaked with more than 15,000 volunteers serving in 52 countries worldwide. Congressional budgets cuts have since reduced that number by half, but over 7,000 still work in 70 countries today. Besides being youthful and idealistic, we were well-educated group of men and women. The vast majority of us were fresh from creating our college education, a minimum requirement at the time. In 1966, the average age of a volunteer was 24, while today has risen to 28 with 7% of volunteers over 50 years of age. Since its founding, the Peace Corps has had more than 180,000 Americans in 134 nations nation worldwide. This is less than 1% of the 26 million Americans living today who have served in the American Armed Forces. Almost half these military veterans are 12 million are in my age group, over 60 years of age. Most of these were drafted into a far less benign legacy of the Kennedy administration, the Vietnam War. This conflict, which started as a revolutionary war against French colonialism, sadly involved into a war to contain the concept of communism. It's horrors that ended up taking over 58,000 American, American and over 2 million Vietnamese lives helped define the baby boom generation. These are uh, my friends and myself uh, as uh, Peace Corps volunteers uh, 50 years later. Uh, there was uh, ended up, uh, we started out with a group of 75 in training in Davis, California. We were being taught as agricultural extension agents, uh, one of the best uh, state universities in the nation, if not the world, when it comes to agriculture. After spending um, six weeks there, the 75 of us that started there, had been culled down to 35 that went to Nepal, where we spent another um, two months in language training, cultural training, and agricultural training. At the end of that time, uh, 29 of us went into the field to start our service. At the end of two years, there were 19 of us left, and uh, now, as you can see, 50 years later, there are even fewer of us left. This isn't the entire group, but it's uh, the bulk of it. So we'll start out with... Um, which everybody's heard of is, is Kathmandu. So, so after an overnight stop in Frankfurt after a flight from uh, New York, we paused briefly in Paris and after viewing the wreckage of a terrorist bombed airliner, Beirut flew on to New Delhi. Uh, there was a six hour delay waiting for a connecting flight on Royal Nepal Airlines to Kathmandu. We enjoyed a spicy Indian meal in the airport lounge before setting into the last leg of our journey northward across the Gangetic Plain towards the Himalayas. No sooner had the plane taken off, I abandoned my seat and found myself waiting in line for the plane's single bathroom. We were experiencing our first cases of dysentery. Our gut twisting bowels verified that we had entered a far different world. I would not see a solid stool again for over two and a half years or until after I crossed the Bosporus Straits into Europe. Um, flying into Kathmandu Valley a half a century ago on an August 15th, 1969 was quite a different, uh, different from the tourist experiences today. My bowels were no longer under my control and the airplane single restroom could not begin to serve the number of us lined up at its door. It was the first but not the last time I learned how embarrassing it is to shit in your pants. We were told to return to our seats, fasten our seat belts and prepare for landing. The airplane slipped into a hole in the clouds and we found ourselves peering down into an emerald valley filled with shimmering rice paddies and a scattering of tiny red roof villages. 
We descended from our DC-6 propeller-driven aircraft on a ramp rolled into place by two barefoot porters dressed in brown, brown military tunics with brass, big brass buttons. They wore black daca topis, rimless flat top caps, and lungi, simple, simple white cloth wrapped around their waist like an oversized diaper that falls to the folds to the knees. They offered to carry our bags to the terminal, but we declined their offer only to find our luggage tossed, tossed roughly from the belly of the airplane into the tarmac below. The terminal was a small yellow one-story brick building with an attached two-story control tower. Ours was the only airplane parked on the narrow tarmac airstrip. We were greeted with floral garlands as we rushed to the ter terminal's tiny bathroom, it consisted of two holes in a concrete floor and a single water spigot with dirty jar beneath it. After proving our cultural sensitivity by using our left hand to splash cold water up our asses for the first time, we climbed aboard a bus that took us down the left-hand side of a narrow road crowded with porters, buses, bicycle rickshaws, pony carts, and tiger striped jeeps. At that time, Kathmandu, with a population of around 145,000, contained only a few hundred motor vehicles. Today, Kathmandu's population is over one and a half million, with double the number of living in the urban sprawl that dominates the valley floor. When we arrived, the skies, even though most of the po uh, population cooked with wood or with dung, were clear and brilliant, brilliant, brilliantly blue. Today, propane is the primary cooking fuel for the wealthy in the middle class, but the poor use a mixture of styrofoam, plastic, dung, and wood for cooking. On windless days, a toxic inversion develops over the valley, hiding not only the snow-capped Himalayas in the north, but often even the surrounding hills dotted with small village, villages and terraced farmland. Our short ride into Kathmandu was a step back in time. Our newly, um, my newly earned degree in European history served me well. Kathmandu reminded me of a 14th century European city, but instead of being filled with tourists, it was packed with its original ha inhabitants. The children entered this like children entering Disneyland, we were glued to the bus windows, our eyes wide with amazement as the minds try to absorb a city's wonders. Towering stone temples and wooden kabota, uh, pagodas substituted for cathedrals and churches. Half-naked children in tattered shirts and dresses, legless beggars pushing themselves around on boards, ghostly Hindu holy men carrying tall staffs, and Tibetan monks holding turquoise prayer beads packed the cobblestone streets. These are photos of Nepal and, the, and some of the surrounding villages at the time. Um, Buddhist temples, Hindu temples were mixed um, uh, statues of Buddha and uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks uh, in these temples. Hindu sadhus wandering the streets, uh, staying in the temples. Um, this was the university, Tribhuvan University at the time, the only university in the country at that time. And this was the uh, king's palace. We were employees of the kingdom of Nepal. We were employees of the king while we uh, lived in Nepal, working as agricultural extension agents. Um, the Hindu temples uh, have been there for uh, seven, eight hundred years. Uh, were beautiful pieces of architecture uh, with statuary surrounding them, uh, cast bells. It was a completely different culture. But uh, civilization had arrived in Nepal. There was now a road into Nepal from India and one road north out into the Kathmandu Valley, excuse me, from India, and one road that led north into China. At that time, that was the only road in the nation. Today, there's roads linking much of the trails that I walked at the time. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm going to talk about uh, no sooner than we arrived in Nepal, Kathmandu, we were assigned uh, our area to work. The area that I was assigned to work in was called the Inner Terai. The Inner Terai is at the foot of the Himalayas. Um, it's at the, uh, there's actually a number of ranges that come out. If you look at Nepal from north to south, there's a phalanx of high peaks, including Mount Everest. It's over 29,000 feet dividing it from what is now China, which it was China then, we just conquered Tibet. South of that is an area of very mountainous terrain, uh, incised with river valleys flowing from the Himalayas. 
these uh, ranges or average uh, uh, potato fields at their higher elevations at 10,000 feet and down in the river valleys, which are about 2,000 feet, uh, is rice and maize and, and, and uh, tropical cro uh, crops. In between are terraced uh, rice paddies, wheat fields, potato fields, stretching from about 2,000 feet in elevation up to 10,000 feet. South of that is the jungle, uh, and it had been a jungle area for uh, a malarial jungle uh, for, for centuries. And really it was uh, and only inhabited by a few tribal groups that had developed a resistance to malaria. Uh, with the arrival of Western technology and malaria eradication projects, which involved spraying each one of these small houses every six weeks with DDT on the walls, uh, malaria had been controlled and people were being beginning to sweep down out of the hills and settle in these rich valleys of the inner Terai. I was, um, and then I'll go one step further, south of that after a, um, a war, uh, in, uh, after the uh, Indian mutiny in the 1850s, uh, Nepal supported the British. And as a reward for that, they were given a strip of land in, uh, south of this jungle area, a number of uh, consolidated small kingdoms that became called the Terai, or it was uh, part of the northern part of the Gangetic Plain. You'll see photos of that shortly. But this was the village that I was stationed in, the village of Biman in the inner Terai. Um, so to get there, I had to hike, as I said, four days. And a part of that hike was um, dealing with uh, some of the native natives of the land. One of the natives uh, was the, uh, this monkey. It was a beautiful fall day and a perfect reward for three um, tense months of training. I felt blessed to be walking beneath an azure sky as colorful flocks of parrots swooped ahead of me through towering forests of brilliant green hardwood trees. The blazing heat that had baked the Gangetic Plains for the past month had abated. The clear water trickling through the cobblestone riverbeds felt luxurious on my bare feet as I traced the shallow river up a narrow jungle gorge. A half-eaten piece of fruit tumbled at my feet. I looked up, and the trees above me were a couple of monkeys. They were Rhesus Ma Maki, an old-world monkey. About the size of a small dog, these gray, pink-faced monkeys have spread across Asia, occupying one of the largest primate territories in the world, second only to that of human beings. Their homeland stretches from the northern China to the southern tip of India and in the, and in the west from Afghanistan east to the coast of Vietnam. They recently have landed troops on a new continent, escaping from captivity during hurricanes. They have found fruit orchards of Florida, easy picking. I picked up a hunk of rotten fruit and tossed it back into the tree. This elicited a sharp screech. Suddenly I was deluged by a hailstone of fruit. They were not a couple monkeys in the trees overhead, but a whole troop hidden there, perhaps 50 or more. I was vastly outnumbered. I took off running as the fruit splattered off my pack. The angry, chattering mob of monkeys bounced from limb to limb in the trees overhead, chased me for half a mile up the stream bed. They not only pelted me with rotten food, fruit, but as I discovered later when safely pausing to clean myself in a quiet pool, their shit as well. So that was my introducing introduction to the wildlife in Nepal. The trails through Nepal uh, in the middle hills had been well developed over the centuries. It was a, kingdom that had been consolidated by, uh, and there was these road houses along the trails that the royalty used and lived in that I could stay in as well. This was one of the local schools. Um, the United States was helping bring education to Nepal, sponsoring teachers and, and Peace Corps volunteers working in these schools. Actually, during my uh, time in the village, I helped establish a junior high school in the uh, village and taught science classes in it. Um, Farming was the mainstay of, of citizens in Nepal. These terrace fields at this time, the rice, it was fall. The rice had just been harvested. Here they're threshing rice on, uh, on these stones. And on the new highway that China had built, they had figured out a new way and a far more efficient way to uh, thresh, uh, thresh the rice. They just laid it on the road and let the trucks and buses run over it. Very uh, good use. So this was a, it was about a four day walk from Kamandu Valley to the village that I lived in. This is the Sunkosi River. Uh, now it's a very popular white river rafting river. Um, 
you can see these steep hills that, uh, with peaks in this area of about 7,000 feet and the river valley is about 2,000 feet. And then I had to cross a, a range of mountains, so the Marabat Lek, who was about um, 7,000 uh, feet high. Let's see if I have something. Uh, yeah. So the next day we started our scramble over a 7,000 foot pass crowned by yet a, another abandoned Gurkha fort called Sinduli Gardi. It too it had sit, was sit a, uh, an invasion of soldiers of the British East India Company a century and a half earlier but perhaps do more to the help of mosquitoes in the jungles below than to the skill of the Gurkha soldiers holding the fort. Late that afternoon, we slid down a money ramparts of the Marabat Lek into the jungle valleys of the inner Terai that had defeated the British army. A fertile bowl of 1,500 feet high and filled with golden rice fields awaited our harvest opened up before us. The southern end of the valley uh, flowed the headwaters of the Kamala River. The monsoon was over, so it was shallow and no wider than a country road. A few hundred feet from the point where we reached a series of heavily eroded jungle hills stood our goal, the bizarre town of Sinduli Marty. This, uh, in the, on the roadways and the, in the, in the hills at that time, uh, this was the only way of transporting goods on the back of porters. As they reached the, um, the inner Terai, there were jeep tracks and roads like this, and you can see in the back an ox cart there. This was the town of Sinduli. As we walked down the, um, a few hundred feet from the point stood a, uh, the bizarre town and administrative center of Sinduli, Marty. As we walked down its main street, little more than three blocks long, we felt like a wild bunch entering a stage set for a Western movie. The muddy street filled with porters and pack horses was lined with dark one-story plank walled buildings filled with closet-sized shops. Bolts of colorful cloth, aluminum and copper pots, herbs and spices and Chinese and Indian medicines, shared frontage with tea stalls and cafes. It was here we expected to meet our new boss, the district agricultural extension agent. We had been told he was expecting us and would assign us at work sites. Well, um, we found out he was on vacation and a vacation in Nepal for an administrator working for the King's government was a pretty indefinite period of time. Um, it, we sat around waiting for him for about a week and a half, um, but it was finally the promise of cold beer that convinced us to check out the luxuries to the south. After patiently waiting a week and a half, early one morning, we left the contents of our packs in the district agricultural office and marched south into the jungles of the inner Terai. First couple of miles consisted of following the knee-deep Kamala River 19 times as it twisted through a narrow gorge it had carved in the yellow sedimentary rock of the Sarawak Hills. Later, as, uh, as the water receded in the middle of the winter, uh, the same route could be driven by these Russian jeeps that you see here, that still included 19 fords of the river. Um, the jungle-clad hills were not particularly high, but were densely covered with hardwood forests containing iridescent flocks of parrots and troops of monkeys. I warily convinced my friends not to toss stones at them. The Kamala River then turned eastward after it entered a broad flank valley flanked by steep hillsides of the Marabat Lek um, and to the north and the Sarawak Hills to the south. Long str uh, strings of skinny pack horses vied with porters packing everything from pots to tobacco along the narrow jungle track paralleling the river. There Paddies and thatched roof homesteads or dirt yards, growling chickens and goats lined the valley floor. Um, and this is the uh, Kamala Koj, the valley and the farmland that I worked in uh, for a period of two years. You can see paddo paddy fields that have recently been cleared from the jungle on the valley floor with the jungle hills surrounding it. Um, so this is in Biman, we joined forces with a dozen porters for our trek through the jungle hills to the Gangetic Plain. Although they eagerly pointed out the spoor of tiger, the only excited excitement we had was chasing a 20 foot long anaconda. Over a foot in diameter, it slithered off like a sinuous rocket into the depths of the jungle, left us breathless after chasing it for the length of a football field. Narrow rivulets, the depths of two story homes, dissected the shortcuts we took to avoid long meanders of the still impassable jungle road. Our pathway forced us to balance precariously on narrow footbridges spanning muddy trenches filled with shatter shattered groves of bamboo. As we neared the Gangetic Plain, we followed deep ruts of two-wheeled logging carts pulled by oxen. 
creaking southward. They were piled high with the forest wealth, ten foot long logs, three to five feet in diameter. Stepping out into the Gangetic Plain, these are all photos of the Kamala Valley and Bimon, where I lived for two years. And I'm going to speed up and read a little less from the book and you know, speak more about uh, this uh, area. So um, the water supply was at the foot of the hill below the village, a creek you'll see pictures of later. This was the jungle track through the jungle. And um, this was the first logging operation we saw. Here they were um, a sawmill cutting planks in a way that uh, occurred in, uh, for much of the time in 17th, 18th, and 19th century America. But technology had come. This was a little, a new diesel powered sawmill operated by some um, Indian uh, immigrants. Flowers were everywhere. It was a beautiful time of year. Um, some of the houses were uh, fairly well established, thatch roof, um, the mud wattle, wall, the walls were uh, woven bamboo, then covered with mud, uh, post and beam construction, wooden dirt floors. Um, and this will give you some idea of the porters that we passed on the way. Um, and the, you know, this is the fall, the wheat fields were being harvested. So to the south, uh, about 20 miles to the south of where I live, was the Gangetic Plain that has been settled for probably three to 4,000 years. Um, these, this is a beady shop where people uh, chew the beady nut with, uh, and it's sold, sold along the way. Life centered around the wells and uh, where uh, the women work. And uh, irrigation was done from ponds where uh, during the dry season, they had to lift the water in from the ponds by hand. This is a counterweight on these swing uh, where they live in logs that, and put the water in, lift them up, and then pour them into irrigation canals. And this was Jonik Pur. This was a district center about 10 miles from the Indian border, the largest um, town in the area at the town at the time. It had a population of about, oh, maybe 40, 50,000 people. Today, it's over a million. And um, you can see a cobbler along the road. It doesn't have all that much uh, work to do. There's, the wealthy had shoes. Most people went barefoot. Um, this is uh, people, uh, the bar local barber shop along the street. Business isn't all that great. Um, and this is the Janaki Mandir. Janakpur was the center of uh, Hindu culture, much like Jerusalem is the center of Christian and uh, Jewish and Muslim culture. Uh, here, Sita and Ram uh, had their kingdom. And this temple was built on um, this temple built in the uh, 19th, 18th century. It was, it was really a piece of uh, fine art. And it was filled with uh, sadhus that came from all over India to worship in this temple. This is, uh, they had fairs there regularly, celebrations, street celebrations, uh, Hindu uh, celebrating the, this, this center of Hindu culture flowers everywhere. My job was to the north in the Kamala Koj, this dry valley at the foot of the Himalayas with jungle hills on both sides. And this was the water source for the village. Uh, you can see it flowing down here. The real problem came in the um, dry season when the creeks got low. It, it, the incidence of uh, dysentery increased dramatically. This was the same creek a little further downstream. People washed their clothes in it. Uh, people would get loaders of water to use to go to the bathroom. Uh, during the period I was there, one of the more shocking things for, for me was uh, dealing with a cholera epidemic that came in. I was working with a couple farmers. This is one of them. Um, on the, this, actually, this gentleman was. He had a family with three kids. We were working. He's actually here roasting a, a, a little bird that he had caught. Uh, he had, we were plowing his field one day. I came back the next day. He had died over the night from cholera. And in the valley at that time, we probably lost three to 600 people from cholera in a period of two weeks. Um, during the period I was in Nepal, I, I, during the, after I got my crops planted, I would take time and enjoy the scenery to the north. So this is a quick shot into the Himalayas. This is what attracts tourism to Nepal today, which is the mainstay of uh, the economy. 
These are the middle hills that I spoke of and the trails that le lead through the middle hills heading to the north. For me, Mount Everest was about oh, 100 miles to the north of me. And this was a trek that I took in the uh, late spring during the hot season in the dry uh, through these hill villages. And most of the villages are built on top of the hills with terraced farmland on either side so they can go down and work their fields and then come back every night to the fields. Initially, the reason for this was if you lived on these ridgetop hills, the wind sweeping across kept the mosquitoes at bay. It kept malaria at bay as well. So most of the hill villages and uh, were all built on these narrow ridge tops where they could catch the wind. These are uh, along the way, there were little tea shops where you could stop and quarters would rest with these benches built into them, carrying their loads. And some of the hills, uh, the forest would look very much like what we have in here in Central Oregon, pine trees and, and, and conifer cedar trees. This was a friend of mine when we went, because as we neared, as we entered Buddhist uh, territory, you can see all these boulders have carved uh, um, prayers on them all. And these are the uh, Tibetan, well, the um, Sherpa villages in the higher country. The fields, these are prayer walls, and many of these prayer walls are 800 to 1200 years old. The fields around them today that used to be largely barley, uh, but potato came in from the Americas, so it's a mixture of barley and potatoes. This was Namche Bazaar 50 years ago. Today, it was a district center then. Today, it's a, a bit of a boom town because of tourism in the Everest region. This is the main street of Namche Bazaar at that time, but you wouldn't recognize it today. And this is the inside of a, of a house. Many of the people, their sons would go to work in India, um, the son of this family was a soldier in India. They have a picture of Indira Gandhi on the wall. He worked as a, a Gurkha soldier in India. This is Tangboche, a Lama Seri in the, up in the Everest region. Uh, when I was there, um, Sir Ed, I helped Sir Edmund Hillary. You can see black plastic. We built this uh, catchment basin and ran black plastic pipe down about two and a half miles from a creek up above. So instead of having people, monks, Every day, carry, the young monks carry water back and forth from the creek. They suddenly could, only had to carry it from this catchment basin up to their homes at the Lamasari. And this was a young monk. Uh, you can see climbers had been here before me. They was wearing a, a down jacket, but turning the prayer wheels around the Lamasari. And this is the backyard of the Lamasari. Indeed, the Himalayas offer spectacular scenery. And then this is the reason that um, Nepal has boomed for tourism. Over the last, this is the, the front of the Himalayas, and this is the, um, the, the high country of the Himalayas. When I, uh, I was there, the Japanese were climbing Mount, Mount Everest at that time. Perhaps you've seen the movie, The Man Who Skied Down Everest. Uh, the women that uh, were carrying uh, wood up to their husbands that were working at the, um, for the Japanese uh, expedition. So I joined this group of women uh, climbing up the Kumbu Glacier, which you see here, uh, to towards Mount Everest. Uh, at the time, just a few uh, weeks before I arrived, six um, Nepali porters, our Sherpa porters, had been caught in, a, in the ice, uh, on a, uh, in the ice tumbled in the glacier, the ice fall, and were killed. And they just um, burned their bodies and set up these. Uh, stones to honor them. This is me and my youth uh, after hiking a few hundred miles. Uh, the last part of the climb includes crossing, walking up the Kumbu Glacier, which you can see at this uh, elevation is covered with, with stone. And uh, my climb, I, this is a little peak right here, is uh, 17,000 feet high. And that's as high as I've ever climbed in my life, just so I could look up and see the top of Mount Everest. This is the photo from uh, the top of Kalapatar of Mount Everest. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the inner Terai where I was working. This is where I had my breakfast. Um, well, I, in Nepal you have two meals a day, dal bot. Uh, but first thing in the morning I'd come here and have a cup of tea with, uh, with uh, buffalo milk in the tea. And this was the school that I taught at, uh, junior high school. and. We had all mixed stages there, depending on how they were doing in school. Um, this is the open air school structure behind it. 
Um, this is what I spent my time doing. Let's see if I can well, talk a little bit. Now, I'm going to talk. Well, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about pests. Let's see how we do it. No, no. Well, anyway, I, I better not go into too much detail on on what it's like growing rice and, and corn and maize. The truth of the matter was, is that we had very successful crops growing maize and wheat. Wheat was something new to their diet. Um, it grew uh, during the winter time when the land was traditionally fallow. So it ended up being a very productive crop. Since then, um, although wheat had been very common in China, it was very uncommon in India and, and that part of the world. But um, now uh, you can, in stores, you can find noodles and things like that because wheat has become part of their diet. Um, maize grew very well there. I, we didn't have as much success with rice. And here's uh, some photos of the people and different fairs and, and a real mix of cultures. In the village I lived in, there were three major language groups. Uh, 17 different languages were spoken quite a different mix of people moving in from both India to the south and the hills of Nepal to the north. This was the monsoon. During three months of the monsoon, when I was growing rice, I couldn't really go anywhere anywhere. The rivers were flooded, the roads were closed, um, the village was inundated with water. Um, but it was a very productive time uh, to grow rice for the rice paddies. This was the uh, road going down to the to the river, it was clearly blocked even for Russian jeeps at that time of year. This was uh, growing my corn crop in the field, the women uh, uh, during the weeds. This was my landlord. Uh, this gentleman um, had made his fortune by poisoning tigers in the local jungle. I understand he, he had poisoned um, six of them. And with his wealth, he had ended up with nine wives. This was the eldest and this was his youngest wife, uh, settled in um, seven different uh, homesteads along the valley. And he had something at the time that I was there, like a dozen children. Um, this was one of his middle wives. These are other farmers in the area. Um, this is cooking at Chura, sort of a roasted rice. Um, just photos of the people that I worked with in the village. Excellent farmers, very eager to learn. And this was for their children. These were their children. This was uh, the, my local friend. He, uh, I, I would buy a, a cloth here. He would then sew it up into um, clothing for me. This was a stall where I could uh, buy matches, cookies, things like that, special treats. And some of the young boys in the village with the, the villages in the background. And these are women uh, pounding pounding rice, hulling rice with a hand or a foot pedal. And uh, before, as you were harvesting uh, rice from the field, you also harvested fish or anything else you could get, including when the harvest came in, you would uh, smoke out the rats, and we'd have a big feast of rat meat. Uh, it was all uh, rice-fed, uh, grain-fed rice. But the people were handsome. This was a young man and his new bride. I was amazed that he had come to town, so he dressed up. This was his uh, shirt, which, um, but he was quite proud to uh, be freshly married. Uh, I, in the winter time. Potters would come in, they'd clear the fields, and they'd produce these bowls that we'd use to store grain in and rice. Um, again, children in the village, just local stores, and of course, um, the meat uh, and milk from goats. Um, these were the pigs in the area. I, well, part of my book tells how I tried to bring in improved varieties of pigs. <laughs> and um, this deals with uh, weddings. Uh, th that was a big celebration and literally families could bankrupt themselves for years over a wedding. This was the uh, groom bringing his bride back to the village after uh, about a five day wedding ceremony where he fed probably, or he and his family fed probably two or 300 uh, people in the local villages. This was the high school um, that was about a, a, day, a day's walk north of me. 
Um, only the very wealthy, of course, could go there because the students would have to live at the school. Uh, this was a wealthy a landlord's house, and this was his daughter, um, who, but this was the main road to their home. And this was uh, for a year, this, when I wanted to make bread, I would bring my wheat to this little mill and we would pour it down this bag and they would grind it on the stone and I'd have fresh ground flour. Uh, by the time I left Nepal or Bimon, it had industrialized, this diesel mill had come in for grinding rice and hauling rice and, and wheat and everything else. So technology was rapidly coming in Nepal. This was my backyard. This was the way we controlled uh, rats in the village. People would have pet cobras in their backyard. These are two cobras mating. And um, this is the train that goes to Darjeeling. This was the closest piece of civilization. And the only time that I saw a tiger in Nepal was in the Darjeeling Zoo, thank goodness. Although in the village, the jungle that I went through from the village into the Terai, I never traveled through that jungle without a group of at least six to a dozen people because um, there were definitely tigers in there. And the time I was there, there were two or three people that were killed and eaten by them. I also made pilgrimages to other parts of Nepal, to the uh, Middle Hills, to the uh, west of, of uh, up the Kalagandaki Gorge, which is to the west of Kathmandu, a dramatic uh, piece of scenery. Uh, that is a pilgrimage route to a temple called Muktinath. Uh, these are the villages en route. This area has been settled for probably a thousand years. So the villages are well established. This was a major trade route uh, that came down through the Himalayas from the Tibetan Plateau. Marco Polo followed this route as he came down from China into India. Mm -hmm. um, Annapurna and Dalagiri, two peaks you may have heard of, rise on either side of this incredible uh, chasm. And these are the villages along the way. And, and I walked with this gentleman. He had, he had spent his time, um, this was his, uh, he had spent time in Pokhara earning enough money to, uh, uh, this was his, uh, for three months work, he had a, a huge bag of corn on his back that he was taking back to his village uh, to the north. And this was salt being brought down from the Tibetan Plateau to be traded in Nepal. Incredible dramatic scenery. There were Tibetan or well, Tibetan monks, Buddhist monks along the way. Um, so looking up at Dalagiri, Annapurna, and um, Machu Putri, another famous peak. And the villages in here, some of the homes were very well developed. Uh, largely because these were uh, ex gurkha soldiers that after spending you know, 30 years of their career working for the British in places like Hong Kong or fighting in the Second World War against the Japanese and Germans had come back and settled and were really quite wealthy uh, landowners in the Middle Hills. So this is Bacha Putri. The, again, the trails follow these village ridges and uh, geese flying below Machu Putri. Mm -hmm. well, villages, the homes in the villages were quite nice. Uh, the hills, the, the wild areas were covered with these huge rhododendron forests that were 30 to 40 feet high. Walking beneath them, you were sort of walking a rose laden path filled with petals falling from the trees. And uh, this is what they looked like in the spring when they were in bloom. And um, indeed, you can see why Nepal is such a popular place. So wrapping up, um, as I left Nepal, the monsoon was sweeping in. I did a few hikes into the middle hills, met different cultures and people. Uh, these are Buddhists and, and Hindu uh, villages who live together. And uh, this is hiking the gorges. The people in the hills at that time were, and still are, quite poor and famine was a huge issue. And uh, following uh, sheep herders into the hill, they'd recently killed a bear that had tried to attack their flock. And you can see these big valleys below these terrace fields, and mountains above, and the Himalayan peaks, and the homes, the children. And one of the things that I talk about in the book, 
book is a little bit about the earthquake that occurred five years in, ago in Nepal. And uh, even when I was there, landslides taking out whole villages were fairly common. So the areas that I talk about, this is uh, Nepal again. It's about 300 miles long. Uh, this is Kathmandu. This was Biman, the village that I spoke of. That's Janakpur, the town on the Indian border. Uh, this is Mount Everest up here. These are the treks I took there. Long Tong and uh, the Kalagandaki Gorges treks that I took there at the time. So um, there's a lot more in the book, but I, I've got a few minutes here. I just want to conclude it with uh, about a little bit about this book. This book is a personal memoir of a green rebel. Excuse me. Since now, 1971, when I last visited Nepal, the adult literacy rate has increased sevenfold. Its population has more than doubled. They fought a civil war and suffered a tragic earthquake. But despite all these achievements and challenges, the average Nepali today is wealthier and more educated than their grandparents were with whom we worked. Thanks to those who embraced change and fought to create a more equitable government, the people of Nepal have reduced famine and dramatically improved their infrastructure. They have cultivated an educational system that has opened their eyes and ears, and most importantly, their minds to a much bigger world. This is a mixed blessing. To find meaningful and viable work, their youth are increasingly forced to leave their mountain homes to provide brains and muscles to the world economy. The magic of our Peace Corps service is that we earn far more than we taught. Our world became one of wonder and acceptance rather than one of rigid judgment and dominance. Like many before us, we also discovered errors in our ways. Technology alone cannot solve the world's problems. How did we use the rich gifts of Nepalese culture when we returned home? What magic did we bring back to America? What seeds were implanted in our minds that have sprouted here and are even now helping transform our own culture? That is what this tale is about, learning and discovering, change, hoping and dreaming of a better future for both ourselves and those who follow. Perhaps more than anything, Nepal gave us a sense of balance, the knowledge that even the worst failure is a lesson learned, and most importantly, offers a hope for a better future. It is a hope America needs now more than ever. So um, I guess with that, perhaps some of you on the chat have have some questions for me. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. Uh, some yeah. wonderful visuals to oh. really uh, narrow home what it's like. It's a completely different world over there. So uh, we do have some questions here and I'm just going to go ahead and go through them. Uh, where else would you go, if you could go anywhere, if you could travel anywhere, uh, would you return to Nepal? Uh, would you go somewhere else? No, I definitely return to Nepal. Uh, since then, I, I do travel the world quite a bit. I leave uh, with Conservation Volunteers International Program. I've left, uh, led five trips to Patagonia, helping build trails in Torre de Pene National Park uh, in Chile. I've I've hiked in the, uh, throughout Europe and throughout the Americas, but uh, I would definitely go back in the fall. The unfortunate thing is um, my wife is no longer enjoys hiking or can hike with me, so that sort of limits our opportunities to return to Nepal. So our, our latest plan is, as you dream during a period like COVID, is to go to some other wonderful Hindu culture like Bali or something like that, or drive around in buses. <laughs> How did you begin this journey? What prompted you to join the Peace Corps? And did you have any say in where you were placed? So at the time that I, um, I was finishing my college degree, I was uh, also working as a smoke jumper here at Redmond. And when I uh, working there, I, I was, was climbing the Three Sisters. And I met uh, 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 an individual who had directed, uh, who had climbed Mount Everest and also had been director of the Peace Corps. Uh, and we spent a, an evening at Sunshine Shelter and he convinced me that Nepal was the place that I wanted to go. So in my senior year of college, I applied for the Peace Corps and uh, believe it or not, was accepted for uh, Peace Corps Nepal. So I felt very fortunate in being chosen. <laughs> 
it wasn't easy to get there, as I shared with you earlier. It was a very competitive situation at that time. And um, our uh, the key was learning the Nepalese language, which I still, uh, uh, I was not as fast a learner as many of my other friends that went there, but I could learn enough. To, and by the time I left there, I was dreaming in Nepalese. So if you spend enough time in, uh, in a strange culture, you fit in. Yes, it seems like these cultures, ours, our Western culture and the Nepalese culture are almost at complete odds with one another. What kind of similarities did you encounter with these people on the other side of the world? Uh, I mean, the key thing is everybody is trying to improve their lives as best they can. And I mean, the amazing thing for me is to look at how dramatically Nepal has changed. When I was there a half a century ago, the literacy rate was 10%. Today, the literacy rate in Nepal is over 80%. And as I said, they're becoming a brain trust for the world. They can't, um, one of the big challenges that came with them temporarily improving their, the quality of their lives, they could literally, um, some of the crops that we planted, I, I could produce five times more crop on the same piece of land by using um, fertilizer and things like that in agriculture. So it provided a, a, a opportunity for the population, unfortunately, to continue growing. When I was there, the population was 10 million. Today, it's something like 25 million. But on the other hand, um, up until this COVID epidemic or pandemic, uh, uh, the population was actually leveling out and starting to decline because um, people uh, realize that how critical education was, they would get their education. But then the people and the young men in the hills, the only place they could find work was abroad. They'd travel to the Middle East and places like that. They weren't home to have children anymore. So it helped, um, you know, by improving the quality of their life, by gaining an education, uh, by gaining enough food, it's, it's changed that part of the world and it's still changing. Um, hopefully, I mean, the, the huge challenge we have in places like that particularly the subcontinent is still growing dramatically is providing for those billions of people that live there. And uh, I don't know if we can solve that problem, but they're all striving to try to improve their lives just as we're trying to do the same thing here. So. And how were you received in the villages? Were you well received? Were the people aware you would be coming? Uh, I know that you said that you were under the direction of the king, but how did the general populace take to you? So at that time um, in Nepal, the king was revered. Um, he certainly, one of the things I talk about in the book is one of the reasons that kingdoms fall out of popularity. If you think about it, the French Revolution occurred when uh, about a third of the population learned to read and write. The same thing is true for Nepal. The same thing is true for the United States. Our rebellion against uh, Great Britain came when about a third of the population in the United States could read and write on their own and learn that there was more to the, uh, that they could speak up of, about the situation. But when I was there, the king was very well regarded. Um, I was uh, in the village I lived in. I was one of three people who could read and write Nepali. I was learning it, but um, I, the postmaster uh, could read and write, as well as the person that was head of the malaria eradication. So I ended up becoming a, a letter writer and a letter reader. And I was very popular. Um, people could not read or write. So when a letter arrived, I would read the letter to them to help me learn the language. And uh, I could do my best to scribble out replies for them. I was, because I was part of the educated and elite in a village of about 350 people, I was very, very well regarded and um, enjoyed fairly high status. I was the doctor sahib in the village. I could cure anything with aspirin almost. And they, they believed I could. But I mean, you know, I think a lot of being a, a physician is convincing people that you, you have the skills. Anyway, it was uh, the people accepted me. They actually welcomed me because they recognized that for them, was high status to have um, a Westerner in a village like that. It said a lot that they measured. The amazing thing for me uh, in retrospect, so the village I lived uh, when I was there at the time, we had a grade school, but after grade school, um, there was the only the very wealthy could go to the junior high school that you saw in Sinduli, which was a day's walk away. 
So I helped start a junior high school there, which was nothing more than a thatch hut in, in the jungle. Today, uh, the uh, BMA in the village I served in now has a college and a university in it. So uh, the world changes and far quicker than you can imagine in, in a lifetime, or uh, at least in my lifetime. So this is an amazing story. This is an amazing journey that you have, and I'm sure everyone is eager to read more about it. Uh, can you wrap up for us though? One last question. What was your biggest personal success on this journey? The biggest success in, in Nepal, you mean? Uh, for you personally, um, what was your biggest takeaway or success? Well, I, I think my greatest success was learning the, the, to learn the Nepalese language. And then as you learn a language, it gives you uh, a different way of thinking. Uh, uh, language is a, a, a door to a different perception a different way of perceiving the world. And I think that that was the biggest gift. Uh, I, I'd studied languages like Russian and Spanish in high school and college, but I'd never really truly learned a language so I could dream in it. And when you do learn a language like that, suddenly uh, it opens, it's another door of perception. You see the world in quite a different way. And by doing that, it helps you come back and see your own world and your own nation in a much different way. And it's certainly affected me. I've spent my career, part of my career, I really truly believe in national service. I was one of the first AmeriCorps directors in the United States for six years. I ran the Northwest Service Academy, um, uh, uh, which uh, worked on environmental projects here in the Pacific Northwest. I really think if you can engage people at that point in their lives in, and engage people in a sense of service like the Peace Corps does or uh, AmeriCorps does, um, you can really transform the world. And I think what I talk about in my book is, or I try to hint at, is um, it, it may not happen right then, right now, but if you look back from 50 years later, you can really see how small actions, small activities change the world. I think I'll just add one little piece to that. So it's the small things you don't think about that, that, that really change, change the world. After I finished up my time as a, a volunteer in the field, I spent oh, a couple months in Kathmandu. And uh, uh, when I first came in, they said, you aren't going back to the United States until till you um, spend a time with an American family. You've been out in the field too long. You're bushed, they called it. So anyway, they put me with a home with an American couple that was gracious enough to accept me. They had a couple of kids. They worked for the embassy. And um, they were uh, their couple, last couple months in Nepal. I, of course, bonded very quickly with their kitchen staff. They had, and especially one of the cooks that had, she had, the woman had taught him to make pies, uh, apple, well, Nashpati pies, but something like apple pies. And boy, I hadn't had a pie for two years. Anyway, I was very excited and I got to know him quite well. Uh, and then I went trekking and that family left and I was ready to leave Nepal. And it was the last week I was wandering the streets of Kathmandu. And this cook comes up to me and says, Saeed, Saeed, um, you know, this couple's left. I'm looking for a job. Can you, can I be your cook? I said, no, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm leaving here in a few weeks as well. Uh, but just a moment, come back tomorrow. Let's see what I can do. So I went and talked to a couple of my other Peace Corps friends we collected equivalent of about, what's, what then was a small fortune in Nepal, about $35, $40. He came back and said, use this to start a pie shop. And when, um, uh, here's the list of the names that people contribute. If they come there, they get a free slice of pie. So uh, less than three days later, he opened a pie shop. Um, it was, he did very well. My friends were happy because they suddenly had great pieces of apple pie. 20 years later, I was reading Lonely Planet. So now Kathmandu is the pie capital of Asia. That's, you can go there and they, in any of the little cafes, they'll have pies. So it, something that you don't even think of at the time turns in you know, magically into transforming a whole world. So it's those little things that make a difference. That's fantastic. John, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Oh, this is you're very welcome. absolutely 
wonderful. Uh, your photos are beautiful and um, your words, hearing them as well, has been uh, truly a transportive experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We encourage you to go to deschutzlibrary.org and check out our YouTube page for more fun free programs coming to you. We hope to see you next time. John, thank you so much. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Paige. Good night.